Carol. I'm going right now to share the presentation so that we can start right away. Um, as you've mentioned, I, I'm, I'm from Paris, so I apologize if sometimes you hear a little bit of French in my English. Uh, that's my um, uh, little accent, let's say. Um, <clears throat> so I am representing the BV Energy Net, and most of our work is based on behavioral science. But I'm myself not a behavioral scientist. I'm a marketer, and I've deep dived in behavioral science a couple of years ago and discovered that actually business is all about behaviors. Um, so it, be it about engagement, uh, recruitment, a uh, churn, a uh, conversion, any of the words that you may use in business are actually related to a behavior. And uh, when I discovered behavioral science, I was actually uh, extremely surprised by some of the um, discoveries I've made. And I would like you to make one just right now and, and make a little test with you um, with one of the kind of experiments that you can find in behavioral science books. So imagine you are all together participating to a pizza party. I mean, you're the organizer and uh, you are, you're in Singapore, so you can't be more than five um, and you would like to order pizza. So you have a choice for the same price, you could either get one big pizza of 18 inch, 45, inch uh, centimeters um, diameter, uh, or two smaller pizza, 12 inch, which is about 30 uh, ish centimeters. So I will uh, ask you to answer the poll right now, but just right now, make up your mind and tell me uh, to feed the group of five people, would you go rather for the bigger pizza or the two smaller ones? So maybe we can launch the poll, Carol, and you just have to pick uh, one of two options. So it's very easy. Um, okay. So we can see live. That's a typical uh, behavioral choice that you have to make. It's a decision. Um, okay, we see stabilizing. I think we're close to the end. Yes, we are. So I will end the polling right now. And definitely the two smaller pizza seem to win. Um, but the thing is, if you do the math, and if and I, I, I really uh, suggest you to do it, if you, uh, I will just share the results. So we have 78 uh, for the two small pizza and 22 for the big pizza. Actually, the, um, uh, sorry, I'm just closing the, Yes, so if you look at the formula to uh, calculate the surface, if you have for the same price, two surfaces, actually the bigger pizza has more surface than the two small ones. Uh, you can check, if you don't know how to calculate, you can go to a, a very funny website called omnicalculator.com uh, where you can do the simulation, enter the size of the pizza and uh, see which one gets the, the most for your bucks. So this is typically a choice that we make intuitively based on what we call heuristics. It means like rule of thumb for us that we think we have more when we have two. That's, that's a general rule of thumb, but that's not the rational way to approach uh, the quantity of pizza. Of course, you could make the choice of two pizza because you want uh, to have something that's more convenient to, to share or because you prefer the crust. So it, there might be other reasons why you have chosen the pizza, the two instead of the one. Uh, but the, real, the reality is that um, fact-based, uh, here the biggest pizza is actually uh, the 18-inch big pizza. So this is exactly what behavioral science is about. Uh, it is studying how people make decisions in the real life, meaning we don't always make decisions with uh, rational um, uh, decision making. We just use rule of thumbs, intuitions, uh, or things that go very quick uh, so that we can cope with everyday decisions we have to make um, in our daily life. So behavioral science uh, is, is not new in a sense because there's been a lot of psychologists studying uh, how people make decisions and also how we can influence them. Um, and this has started long ago and inspired marketing. Uh, I would just quote uh, Cialdini as part of the 
the most influencers of the persuasion theories that have been used by marketing people. But more recently, like uh, um, in 2004 with the, the book Nudge, a new uh, academic field has gained traction called behavioral economics. And behavioral economics is based on the work of uh, scientists. Uh, the father of, of, uh, of the discipline is actually Daniel Kahneman. He's written a book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, and, and was uh, uh, awarded the Nobel Prize, uh, just as uh, the Nudge or co-author Richard Taylor was uh, also recently in 2017 uh, awarded the, the um, Nobel Prize. So um, these uh, books, and I would quote the third one, which has also been a very po popular in the marketing um, world, is Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely's. So all these books have been studying how we make decisions, what are our biases, and what gets in the way when, when we have to choose uh, the, the, the best option for us, which sometimes uh, is not what we end up to choose. So the summary of what behavioral science is all about, it's just saying that we are not the rational, the rational agents maximizing our self-interest. We are more fallible humans. We are driven by impulse, by habits, rule of thumbs, and also what others are doing, uh, which uh, sometimes we could call herd mentality. So the new news about behavioral economics is that it has offered uh, to people working on behavioral policies alternative way to try and change people behaviors. Uh, basically, most of the tools used by the governments um, and, and, and administrations and public policies to change people behaviors were about rules, so laws, what you're allowed or not to do, were about incentives, uh, so it's about money or fines, um, or about information, um, with the assumption that if you get the right information, you will make the right decision. The thing is that it's not exactly like this that we uh, behave. And uh, a lot of these traditional ways of uh, uh, acting on behaviors is not always efficient. And so uh, the book Nudge has created a fourth uh, option, which is called uh, nudging, which is a little help, a gentle help, um, channeling behaviors by just changing the environment. So here in this example, if I'm a driver, I could be told that it's uh, uh, forbidden to uh, go beyond certain speed limits, um, or I could be informed, um, and I may have a fine actually if I go beyond. <laughs> I could be informed that there is a school nearby. Um, and so there are already information systems to prevent me from going too fast, uh, approaching a zebra crossing. But the one you can see on the picture is actually a 3D illustration. It's painted on, on the uh, street and it's actually making me uh, stop and, and, and try to break because there is the feeling that there is an obstacle that I may uh, bump into. So this is a change in the environment that drives to the desired behavior without going through all the classical ways of uh, changing behaviors. So this is all what nudging is about. Um, it's about having people do or prevent people ha have some um, negative behaviors by changing uh, the way you present uh, the choices. So I love this example. It's an ashtray. It's near a stadium. It's, it's in UK. Um, and one of the problems it's trying to solve is why do people throw the cigarettes uh, on the floor? And one of the reasons when you observe people uh, smoking is that if they don't see at um, like in the five seconds they need to throw their cigarettes uh, in ashtray close, close to the, uh, where they are, they would actually uh, tend to, to uh, throw um, the cigarettes uh, on the floor, just like the reflex. So it's, it's something that no one thinks about. Um, but here, for example, this is typical uh, nudge where the ashtray has been turned into a, a poster, something very visible. And instead of um, presenting the choice into uh, should I throw or, or, or in the ashtray or, or on the floor uh, my cigarette butt, here you can choose whether um, the best player in the world is Ronaldo or Messi. So this is typically what behavioral scientists call a choice architecture. You change the way people perceive the action they have to make, uh, turning it into a choice that is rewarding and that is uh, giving them uh, uh, some feedback. Here it's uh, by having a transparency, you can actually see that most people do that. Uh, and by voting, you can also 
participate to some uh, interesting fun uh, and feedback uh, that is encouraging you to do the, the, the choice. So this is typically uh, what we would call a gentle help, a nudge for people to um, drive um, a new behavior. So all what you've seen is actually based on uh, psychology and uh, what researchers have called the brain system one, um, which is the automated brain, how we make, uh, uh, how we uh, automate some of our habits without even thinking about it. So what is all, all around intuition is, is most often driven by system one. Um, and before we move into system two, which, which is the more rational part, uh, actually, the, the system one has already made a decision. So irrationalities, it's all the rule of thumb that we use to make decisions. Emotions are also very important in the way we, we make decisions. The environment, uh, so the place, the moment, and the, the way the, the choice is framed, but also uh, the others. So uh, what other people are doing is actually very important uh, to my self-image, but also to my tendency to adopt or not uh, a behavior. So there's been a lot of research and uh, uh, it's been a lot focused on public uh, policy and, and uh, uh, non-profit areas. But more recently, some uh, authors have tried to transfer and translate this behavioral science knowledge into a direct application for marketing, for UX, um, or customer experience more generally. So I've, I've picked a few books here. If you're interested in more, you can just take a picture of the QR code and you can download a reading list uh, of, of the um, main books I would recommend. Uh, the last one here is Behavior Business has been published by one of our um, CEO of uh, the UK Energy Unit, BV Energy Unit in, um, uh, in the UK. And it's actually explaining why some of the key words that we use in marketing are all about behaviors. So trial, habits, satisfaction, prevention, compliance, engagement, churn. And today what we're going to look at is, is engagement, uh, because engagement is a concept that's very familiar, uh, that marketers are very familiar with. Um, and we'll see how we can use some behavioral um, uh, triggers to increase engagement. So I will share with you here a few of the frameworks that we use to uh, drive our thinking when we need to um, uh, inspire from behavioral science. Basically, behavioral science has uh, documented more than 200 biases um, that can affect our behaviors. When I say affect, uh, they can influence us in a positive or in a negative way. And um, most of people in most of the cases are actually prone to these uh, biases. And when you know them, you can actually e either compensate them or you can use them to the benefits of the behavior you're trying to leverage. So we've called that, we've, we've selected uh, about 20 of them that we believe are the most useful for the marketing uh, and the UX world. Uh, we've called them the drivers of influence. Uh, each letter is an acronym for uh, one of these um, uh, driver. And I will illustrate with the case study in the second part, uh, how you can use them as a source of inspiration to frame uh, your uh, journey and, and to create uh, new drivers of influence that can increase engagement. So uh, you will find, um, I will at the end leave you the QR code again, you will find these templates available um, for download uh, at the end of the presentation. So these are some of the examples. <laughs> um, I think it's better to, to go through the case studies. Um, of course, each letter like T for transmitter means like who, if, if someone says something, it ha doesn't have the same impact on you uh, depending on who it is. Um, and sometimes we don't always think, we think it's the brown talking, but sometimes it doesn't need to be the brown. It, it can be someone else. Um, the D for default means that if you uh, frame the choice with the uh, pre-selected options uh, leading to the desired behavior, of course, um, it's the typical case of the opt-in. Um, it will drive the behaviors. There's a lot of uh, common sense in these drivers, but if you have a systematic use of them, you would, you would realize that you can actually create new functionalities or new uh, um, ways of presenting things that are uh, driving uh, consumers' behavior. I'll give you an example here that we um, have 
um, carried on in, in LATAM. Um, basically, it was during COVID uh, and banks were really prone on having uh, their uh, customers use the do-it-yourself um, automats like to uh, either to uh, uh, put money in or, or to do some of their banking operations uh, uh, by themselves. But the problem is that most of the people would go and meet someone at the counter. So, uh, and the reason is because there are some biases at play, like people don't want to say that they don't know how to uh, use these machines. And uh, so that's the, the ego part, uh, but they are also very um, uh, afra afraid of, of doing something wrong because this is about money, this is about banking. And so loss aversion uh, is something that, that would drive them away from these machines. Um, so by doing an ethnography and understanding what are the barriers that prevent people from going there, one of the key understanding is that the jobs to be done of each of these machines are actually absolutely not intuitive. Uh, and it would increase uh, the statu quo and all the, the, the non-willingness of people to take action because they have a choice to make. And sometimes uh, when we have a choice to make that is too difficult, the first thing we do is not to choose or here in that case to, to go for the simple ways, meeting someone at the counter. So what we did is actually clarify uh, the jobs to be done, just saying like cajero para dispositos means this one is, is to uh, um, put money on your account and the other ones are to do all the other operations. And if people are a bit worried about whether this is easy and, and whether they can do what they have to do, it's actually written on the floor. So this way, <clears throat> by just having a few of the touch points uh, in the upper, upstream of the journey, we have created a new path uh, before people, when they see the crowd go and, and queue with the others at the counter, actually, you just highlighted uh, and made salient that there is an option of do it yourself, which actually was not really visible in, in the way the um, uh, branch was um, uh, organized. Um, and the second thing is, uh, if you want people to take action, give them an immediate benefit for doing it. Um, and here, it, it's simple. It's about saving time. Uh, by discussing with the ones who do use uh, these machines, we actually understood that this is probably the simplest thing to, to highlight so that pe people can um, take the path. And the path is actually following a real path um, footprints that you can, you can actually find the machine quite easily. It had, had an impact, a tremendous impact on the um, number of people, like plus 35% of people uh, entering the agency actually moving uh, to the do-it-yourself machines. So this is an example just to, to show that we didn't change the machines, we just changed the way to present them. Um, but to understand that, we had to go for an understanding of the context. And that's one of the key lessons of behavioral science, that context is king. Um, and if you want to understand a behavior, if you want to understand why people do something, you first have to understand what's the role of context. It's not because they want or do not want. Um, it's not because it's, it's painful or, or it's delighting, like we used to say when, when we do UX. It's also because sometimes there are implicit barriers in the environment that prevent them from uh, moving further. Uh, not something they would complain about because they don't even remember when, and they would always find excuse if you ask them why. Um, so if you want to understand how to change behavior, you would also need to focus um, on this context and how it influences their behaviors while they are not always um, conscious about it. So to do that, uh, we use a, a, what we call a behavioral challenge. It's a way to rephrase uh, your journey exploration with a challenge, which is if you want to change behaviors, you have to define first, what is behavior A that you observe today? And what is behavior B that you would like people to have tomorrow? And from there, uh, you will then observe those two types of, uh, of people, which we don't always do uh, in our UX research. So you would do a sample to observe the people who currently have some barriers, but would, would be um, probably okay to use it if we could overcome these barriers uh, and the people who already adopted the new solution. And from there, you would focus your observations in the context. It's a bit like a cycling uh, race. Um, there are factors that would help the runner to go uh, from point A to, to point B. 
Um, and some of them are linked with the environment. So is the slope in the right direction? Uh, are there some obstacles? Uh, is the social context encouraging for that? Um, so of course you can collect all the explicit barriers, what we call micro barriers and, and, and triggers when asking questions, because if people um, have some um, complaints, they will always expl ex explicit them. But there are lots of implicit things that people can not necessarily phrase that you have to observe on the very place. Um, and to do your uh, homework as a user researcher, um, we would use a challenge that we call, it's a one sentence where you put yourself in the shoes of the, of the customer and you ask yourself, how, how will I myself, customer, be encouraged to do more or less of this behavior and the behavior should be described of uh, described with what, where, when, uh, to be extremely precise and overcome actually the, the barrier. And so to inspire yourself, you can use behavioral insights, uh, sectorial insights, technological insights or design insights. There's a lot of source of inspiration, but this is the first step to create uh, solutions that um, can be a small detail that has a huge uh, impact. If I give you examples, quoting Dan Ariely, Dan Ariely says, behavioral science is about making the invisible visible. Uh, and if you are um, a behavioral scientist, you would know that some factors in your journey are actually um, of a, a tremendous importance in the memories you will, uh, you will, that will stay with you uh, about the customer experience you, you've just had. So if we take the example of hygiene, uh, people uh, to, to evaluate if a hotel room is clean, they have a look around and there are a few cues that make them um, confident that this has been cleaned. So of course there are obvious cues like, uh, like the blue ribbon uh, that is actually sort of a nudge uh, to, to, to encourage the perception, the positive perception. But if they happen to see a hair that would ruin their, their overall perception. So there's one little detail that can actually completely erase uh, the, all the effort you've placed into cleaning the room. So um, you would brief your, your, your staff to make sure that uh, these little details are, are taken care of because they have a tremendous importance in the judgments of, of people. Same if you talk about security, uh, security feeling is, is a lot influenced by the lighting in the parking or, uh, or even the music. If you want people to feel more secure by adding music, you can actually change uh, their perception. So it's a lot of irrationality, but people make a quick judgment uh, from cues of the environment and you can have a, you have a power to influence that. Uh, it's also true with health risks. Um, and of course, giving feedback uh, that you care for your staff and that your, your, your people are actually uh, fine um, can be very important in, in these days. So I've been very quick in presenting like what is behavioral science and, and uh, um, how it can be used. Um, I will make a pause right now, maybe to take a few questions. Um, if you don't have any questions uh, before, and, and just to give me the time to read on the chat, uh, I give you a little challenge. There is in this drawing, there is the picture, uh, there is a drawing of a car that is hidden somewhere. It's a car. If you can find the car, you just write in, in, the, in the chat box. So let me open the chat box because I see there are a few questions. So. Uh, would you like me to read out, uh, Richard? Oh, yes, yeah. please. Yeah, please. Yeah, that would be good. All right. Ah, someone has found the car. <clears throat> okay. So, so go ahead. So, yeah, so far there was one question from Karan. This is related to the brain system uh, behaviors that you mentioned earlier. Yes. So are any of these behaviors mapped to actual, I think it's a more curious question. Are they mapped to actual parts in the brain or are they just named that way? Um, well, there are different biases. Uh, basically, they are what we call the individual biases. Uh, and within that, we have two types, sensory biases. It, optical illusions can be uh, one of them. Uh, and action-related biases. Uh, these ones are 
Um, for example, loss aversion is something that we see across the countries, across the geographies, is people privilege uh, um, the loss of aversion instead of uh, uh, making a bet on, on a, a, a positive outcome. So they, they prefer to secure what they have instead of taking a risk to win more. Um, so loss aversion is, is an example of uh, action-related bias uh, where when given a choice, the, the people would, would tend to um, prefer uh, preserving their, what they have instead of, of, of taking a risk. So brain system one uh, is anything that happens uh, quickly uh, and that is driven uh, without pondering too much uh, and processing information, uh, which, which would, would be called brain system two. So there is a, a list of biases and a lot of them are uh, system one driven, not all of them. But the second family of biases that we call um, social biases uh, are more related to your interaction and, and the norms uh, that are being created within a group. So it can be interdependent norms, like things that evolve because you interact with others, or more cultural norms, things that come from a what uh, you've learned um, from from your uh, either your your country, your your family, or, or things that are, that are uh, like uh, usage or routines or, or uh, rituals. Um, that are common in the place uh, where you live. So these are um, very different, but you would not question whether you, you uh, put your shoes off before entering uh, a, a place in Japan, because this is a behavior that everyone is doing. Um, so uh, these are uh, becoming habits, what we call habits, and habits are actually uh, behaviors that have become automated. I don't know if this is answering your, your question, but let me, if you have any other question. No, uh, Karan says thanks in the chat. Uh, folks, you know, because we don't have like, I mean, uh, I think we have a, a decent size gathering, but uh, not that many questions. So if some of you at any point have a follow up, you could, uh, I, and while your question is being answered, you could uh, unmute yourself, right? If you have a more elaborate follow up. Okay. So, I, I can see one that uh, I will keep for the end, maybe, uh, which is, is it advisable to use behavioral technique to nudge customers into driving engagement or buy a product, pharmaceuticals, financial services? This is a very important question. This is about the ethics of nudge. Um, and I think this is something we will cover uh, as marketers before behavioral science was existing. Uh, this question was already, already there. It's, uh, it's how do you use your marketing technique to actually um, uh, persuade um, in an ethical way uh, your, cons your customers. So we will cover that in the end. Um, and yes, uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, thinking around um, ethics. One of them is we do nudge people when they, are, they have the intention. Uh, it means that people have the intention, they have a job to be done. Uh, you can nudge them to make it easy for them to, to get this job delivered. Whenever they do not have an intention, uh, you would, we would call this a, a dark pattern uh, or a way to cheat people. Um, so th that's a way to uh, differentiate between dark nudges and, and, and nudging for good. But we will go into more details because there are some more criteria to question your practice uh, in the way you use this principle uh, so that you make sure it does not backfire. Because of course, um, if you try to cheat your customers, um, it may have a short-term impact, but you're not, you're not actually building any trust in the long term. And uh, you can see that trust is tremendously important in the customer relationship you're building with your customers. So <clears throat> um, we'll come back on the criteria to evaluate nudges and which ones are ethical, which ones are uh, challengeable. Uh, but I will give you an example here uh, of engagement uh, through a case study that we did with the United Nations. Um, the challenge here uh, is actually to nudge. I, I can see that in the chat. Can you? Yeah, yeah. There, are more, there, there are more questions. Would you like to take more questions, Richard, before we move to that? Uh, do you tackle biases linked to gender norms? Uh, Yes, of course. Um, gender norms is, is actually something. Uh, it's 
and we will talk about gender equality in, in a minute because this is the case study we are dealing with. Uh, but gender norms uh, can be a, a very dangerous uh, area to, to deal with. Um, and it's not necessarily with nudge, but more behavioral interventions that you would deal with this. Anything related to nudge, to, uh, sorry, to um, uh, norms uh, can be tricky if it's related to any sense of identity. So typically, uh, gender norms are uh, providing, a, a, are touching uh, with a sense of identity. And in that, in that sense, it's, it's something you have to deal with care because it, it can create a lot of back uh, of uh, reactants of uh, people push back. Um, and we've seen a few advertising uh, um, uh, recently. I don't know if you remember uh, PepsiCo um, uh, or no, I, I would take the example of uh, uh, Procter & Gamble uh, and Gillette uh, trying to, to um, tackle uh, negative masculinity. Um, and, and this is typically something that backlashed uh, because you are, you are touching uh, something that's very sensitive, which is uh, the group identity. So I would say any group identity, be it national identity, be it gender identity, or, or even a cultural identity within a firm is something you have to deal with care. Uh, and, and nudge is probably not uh, the simple solution that you can use uh, to tackle that. But I can show you an example here uh, for a case study we've, we've um, uh, dealt with the United Nation, uh, the, the project, so, oh, the car. Uh, before we move further, um, the car, uh, for the people who haven't seen the car, it's actually here. Um, and I love this drawing because it's actually cheating your brain. Uh, it's, it's using patterns of, of car wheels to divert you from uh, finding where the car is because your brain is actually searching for things with what we call stereotypes. So it's, it's preset shapes of things that you would like to find uh, in an automated way. And we've used that uh, to actually prevent you from finding the car because the car is, uh, is very small and it's designed in a different way than all the, the uh, decoys that are uh, across the drawing. Um, uh, Richard, so th there's... Yes. Uh... There's, there are a couple of questions that relate to sort of the sales and marketing end of things. Uh, would you like yes. to take them later uh, or now? I think we'll take them after the case study to make right. sure we've covered right. the case. And then we can stay longer with anyone who wants yeah. to debate around this uh, because I think it's a very important aspect. Um, here, there's no debate about uh, the movement itself because the cause is actually a, a a fight for gender equality. And it's a, a movement that has been initiated by the United Nation women. Um, uh, one of the VP is actually um, Fumzile Mambla. She is a former uh, political um, person from um, South Africa. And she's, she's actually witnessed what happens when you try to solve uh, with apartheid a social problem with only half of the population uh, involved. So she, she said, we, if we want to, to tackle this problem, it's not just about women to speak out, it's to try to onboard men, uh, also be on, on the same side um, and, and create a, a realization that they can have um, an impact. So it was launched in 2014 um, by the ambassador, Emma Watson, uh, and she actually they did a great uh, inaugural uh, speech. So I, I recommend you if you want to go on the website, he for she, um, to actually engage men to sign as a commitment for the he for she movement. So it's, it's not about selling anything here. Uh, you don't have any benefit in committing. Uh, it's about real engagement uh, that you, you realize that this is a cause that's worth uh, getting your name uh, um, on it. So what they did is actually two things. They started by uh, influencing uh, the, or by engaging some of the key leaders, the, the key opinion leaders. And when you want to change a, a norm, um, and particularly when it's tackling uh, uh, identity markers, it's very important that you have the key opinion leaders within your reference network that are onboarded. So here, um, it, it was heads of university presidents, CEOs, but also heads of states. Um, for example, in, in APAC, we have the president of Indonesia or uh, the 
Prime Minister of Japan, and, and many other countries have actually uh, had their um, key opinion leaders committing uh, to this cause and, and trying to show uh, initiatives that they will lead in their country, in their companies, or in their universities. The second part, which is the one we had to uh, work on, is, is how do you nudge everyone? Not just, not just the key opinion leader, but the people who are somehow um, interested or, or, or positive about the idea, but who don't realize that they can actually do something. Um, and one of the ideas was to create a platform that's open to the general public, where uh, the ambition is to have encourage uh, 1 billion men across the world to commit uh, just by saying, I, I agree with this principle, and I'll try to carry them where I work and where I live. So this website uh, was actually, so this is a, a very, very ambitious challenge. And in terms of behavior, if we uh, look at uh, one of tiny bits is, how do we get people engaged through the website? So one of the reasons we, we, we have dealt with this problem in priority is that current, I mean, not currently, but when we, we took the project, actually, uh, the website only had 2% two, two conversion, which means people may arrive on, on the website or may be interested, but they, they actually don't even try uh, to engage and register the name uh, as part of the movement. So this is how the landing page was. Um, and it was quite clear that there was a, a something to do. It was simple, it was nice. Uh, it was advertising some uh, cultural events and it, it was saying like, are you he for she and count me, count me in. So one of the first thing that we did, it, did is actually go for and do our, our homework um, and go for the interviews and observations um, of the two populations I was mentioned. So people who are currently, uh, who have used the websites and who are already uh, registered and, and people who are actually uh, positive to the idea of gender equality, uh, but uh, who have not been exposed to the website and who are not uh, aware of, of uh, he for she. So the idea is to recruit people in a, in a state where they are, we know that they don't have any barriers um, uh, to uh, such kind uh, of causes. So we would have a, a a screening uh, to make sure that we have these people and, and we would have them go through a scenario to identify these micro levers and micro barriers um, throughout the, the commitment process. So it would be like a bit like a, a design thinking process where the input uh, and the output are a little bit different. So it's, it's just about redesigning the existing um, journey by changing some little details to increase the engagement uh, of these people. So basically what uh, is interesting is that when you look at people who have already engaged, you get information about what was important to them, what made them uh, commit, and, and what could be uh, emotionally uh, engaging that could, you could leverage uh, later on for others. Um, so the, the way to go through the uh, journey is actually um, through the engagement, uh, we call it the stairs of change. So it's, it's kind of a, a wheel where uh, you start from preparing the field to engaging without effort. Then you move to facilitating the choice and then you encourage nicely. So at every moment of truth where people um, act or not, uh, you can actually use the touch points you have to try and encourage them to move into the right direction. So what we've done is take all the biases that people have um, and position all of them that uh, all together can actually drive people, channel them into the right direction. So it's, of course, before um, it's who is talking, uh, at which place, what time is the right moment to get, to get people uh, attention, who is the messenger, um, and then so this is what we call the system one. Um, if you talk to emotions, uh, to intuition, why they've done something, they would never mention things that play an, an implicit role in their decision. Um, that's 
uh, automated and that's uh, um, affecting the, what we call the choice architecture. And if you want to expand uh, the realm of inspiration to shape your other journey, you can actually make your interventions more successful by combining um, different touch points. So it's not just about solving the problem of, of the job to be done in one uh, domain, but maybe collaborating with the marketing people, uh, with the UX people, with maybe some other stakeholders who can carry the message and connect to your ecosystem and make it um, a more engaging story. Uh, of course, testing is important, it's even key. Uh, all what I've shown you is, is about uh, proving that this is uh, working. And there's a lot of uh, knowledge on, in the behavioral science uh, world uh, to create uh, tests that are relevant, but I had no time to develop that today. So I just wanted uh, to share some of the ideas. Um, and uh, if you're interested in getting more information, you can just take a picture and you will be able to access um, the reading list, uh, but also some of our frameworks. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll uh, share the recording later on um, through email. So I'm happy to connect with anyone uh, on the social media also, and uh, we'll take some more questions uh, right now. Oh, by the way, there is a, a, a great podcast where all the key authors of behavioral science have accepted to answer our questions. So if you want to learn just by listening to their stories, uh, you can also find this on, on our website. There we go. So I'm finished. Maybe we can uh, take some questions. Uh, Vibe, you want to uh, raise I, some, some of them? Thanks, Richard. Uh, you know, uh, while listening to you, you know, I, in fact, just uh, messaged one of my, you know, you know uh, uh, design partners on, hey, uh, just just to inquire about our uh, onboarding and what are we doing to make onboarding easy or are we uh -huh. emo uh, emotional elements statistics and so on okay uh, but it's uh yeah I, I think it was quite insightful um and i can see some positive comments in the chat as well okay uh we have an older question and i'm sure some more will flow in so folks please feel free to uh, post the questions uh there were two questions which i'll combine one was by uh, Miroslav, uh, which was around behavioral science and sales, and the other yes. was around actually also from from peers, which is also around. It. So let me just combine them. So you know we've we've seen like some great examples of UX design, and you know whether mm -hmm. online or offline. Are there any examples to get people intrigued, uh, you know, while maybe making sales to clients or partners? And uh, it's, from peers, it's a similar question, but have you used any such techniques in order to uh, engage potential customers? Uh, the, the answer is yes. And I will just start with the general uh, idea of if there is an intention and your nudge is actually to move to action, um, you're on the right path. If there is no intention, uh, this is what we call the dark pattern. So um, even in a sales relationship, um, the interaction between a salesperson, an advisor, and, and someone who has a, to make a decision, someone who has entered the branch and wants to invest, for example, um, they want to uh, invest the, the savings they have, they, they have to make a decision between very various options. And in, in a lot of the cases, um, there are lots of biases that gets in the way because people are, there's the loss aversion, but there's also the time discounting. People are, are uh, not prone in investing for future return. Uh, and they are also very confused by the, the complexity of some of the offerings, particularly in the, in the banking or the insurance industry. Um, it's very difficult to understand the vocabulary that is used by uh, the technical vocabulary. So. Uh, when you nudge people, it's not to sell them something they don't need, because that would be uh, a, first a dark, dark pattern, and that would be the worst you can do if you want to have people repurchase um, or uh, build a trust, trusted relationship with them. Um, so I would say, but you can still uh, improve the relationship during the sales process. Uh, you can actually nudge the salespeople to uh, more customer centricity like asking the right questions. Uh, if I'm a salesperson, I'm in a shop and I have to go into a, um, 
like to move uh, in the uh, in sorry in the reserve to 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 check for the stock and I leave my customer. Um, this is something that will be very prejudicial to the to the experience of the customer. If I nudge them. Uh, to explain why you're, you're leaving the customer um, so that when they come back, um, there is a good reason why things are happening. You can actually improve the customer experience, but you can also make the choice more easy and more um, uh, simple so that people, instead of not deciding, make a faster decision for something that's good for them. So again, uh, the, the question to ask, um, and this is an example of, um, ethical framework that you can uh, use to decide whether you're on the right side or on the wrong side is, what is the purpose of the nudge you're designing? Is it contributing to the benefits if, for a welfare goal or is it just uh, a goal for your brand? Like who, what's the purpose behind? Um, in terms of choice, do you leave people the possibility to retract themselves, to opt out, uh, to uh, is the choice reversible or are you trying to lock them in? Um, are you trying to uh, reduce the options and hide the, the, the options that uh, would actually be the best for them? Um, if it's the case, uh, you're actually destroying trust. Uh, but again, and in terms of uh, um, outcome, one very good idea, I mean, what, what very good way to, to see whether you're on the right or, or the wrong side of, of nudge is, um, ask your target audience. Like if the target audience is, is the salesperson, would they be happy to be nudged to do something? Or if the target audience is the um, uh, final consumer, uh, do they think this is something uh, they would approve uh, in terms of uh, uh, intention? So the outcome is very important. Uh, and in the end, are you transparent about your nudge? Like, are you giving the choice leaving people to, to make the final decision or are you not? Again, if someone enters a branch or a shop, it's because they have an intent. So there's, no, um, there's nothing wrong in selling a, a garment or giving a choice between two colors because when you do that, you actually frame the choice in a way that people engage more into buying instead of uh, uh, buying or not buying. So this is tricks that mar marketers or, or salespeople know very well but that customers know also. Um, and because they are entering uh, a place that is clearly uh, a place where a transaction is going to happen, they know they have to uh, discuss, bargain. And uh, uh, I would say customers are also the first to negotiate and to nudge their, their salespeople. So I would say this, this part of uh, nudging sales can absolutely happen also in the, uh, uh, in, relationship like call centers. We've been working with some call centers to facilitate some of the uh, uh, operations. When people call, uh, they, have to, um, uh, they have to do an operation, but before that they have to identify themselves by uh, doing some kind of code. And uh, we, uh, we could see that actually a lot of them uh, were making mistakes because the way it was phrased was terrifying them. Like if you make a mistake, you, you're gonna be, um, something is going to uh, wrong is going to happen. So, uh, by changing the way to ask customers to identify themselves and making it more uh, warmly and and sh showing that it's actually to their benefit, it's to secure their money. But also by having a counterintuitive argument like saying, "Take your time," you, we would actually um, uh, see that we had we have reduced the pressure, and people were uh, first right first time much more often. So sometimes counterintuitive um, arguments uh, with, between the salesperson or the operator and the client can change uh, the relationship uh, and, and the outcome uh, of it. So to the benefit of the customer, because at the end, um, if you have to redo your security check two or three times, it's taking time, it's stressing you, and it's also stressing the guy online he, he very often is incentive with the time he spends with you. So by smoothing that, you can actually create a better interaction. So these are examples of uh, um, how we can nudge sales, uh, how we can make sure that it remains ethical. But I would say it's not the ethics of behavioral science, it's the ethics of sales and it's the ethics of marketing. Um, and of course, behavioral science is adding new tools to do that, 
But these questions uh, have been around um, for ages. And I think whenever you talk about sensitive targets who have no intention, uh, who can be manipulated, um, you have to be very careful. And I would encourage you to have your own uh, guidance in terms of uh, what is my own ethic as a designer. Um, so yes, this would be part of the consultancy we would uh, um, give uh, because the tendency is to say, I want to convert, okay. But I would rephrase that <laughs> is what is it, what is the benefit for your consum consumer? If there is one immediate, um, you, can, you can have a, a, you can use these principles uh, in a very transparent way. Have I answered your question? Um, I think we are looks, running over time. That yeah, looks, looks like that, looks like that. Um, Richard, uh, so, I mean, that was a great session. Uh, I see no more questions coming in. Uh, it's okay. mostly thanks. So how about uh, everybody on the call? Uh, uh, it looks like you all had a great time. Thanks for st uh, sticking by so far. As uh, one last thing that we would do is, uh, you know, we're all going to take a photo of ourselves. So I request everybody to turn on the camera. I'm going to give you 30 seconds because might have caught some people off guard. Uh, please uh, turn on the cameras and we're going to take a nice uh, big global screenshot. All right, so I'm looking to see some faces. There we have it. Ah, just a minute. Okay, just give me a moment. All right. Okay, let's go. One, two, three. Go to page two once because there are more people. One, two, three.